Hi everyone, here is the Book Chemist once again, and today I'll be talking a bit about one of my very favorite writers, Umberto Eco. I love Umberto Eco's novels, I love his protagonists, so brilliant and yet so hapless, uh, always very intelligent and yet liable to stumble headfirst into danger and into error. I love the way his books have of spinning out of control and getting lost into maybe a subplot, maybe a conversation, maybe even just a vertiginous list that stretches for three pages. And I love the way he can capture the ambivalent, ambiguous and dangerous relationship that exists between the world of ideas, the world of books and uh, philosophical reflection, journalism, pictures and so on, and the real tangible world all around us. Umberto Eco has got legions of fans all around the world, but I must say that I've also heard this fiction criticized quite harshly, especially within academia and the world of criticism, and especially in Italy. Why is that? Is it just envy? Is it because of the specific nature of it? It's because of envy. It's because of envy most of the time. Uh, there are fewer worse crimes in the cultural world uh, in Italy than being very successful at what you do. But at the same time, I must say that many of the readers whom I've known to criticize Eco's works do so for very legitimate reasons. Uh, Eco is quite a unique writer and for that very reason he's not gonna be uh, to everybody's taste. That rambling tendency that I mentioned before and that I generally like very much can also be read as a tendency of his novels to lose themselves inside their own bottoms. To some readers, Eco is just too cerebral, too scholastic, enamored and even obsessed with fairly abstract, uh, fairly complicated and self-serving philosophical and academic ideas. In many ways, Umberto Eco reminds me of another writer I like very much, Thomas Pynchon, because of their concern with paranoia, because of their freewheeling approach to historical fiction, because of the liberties they take with mixing historical record and, and fiction. Uh, and with anachronisms, but at the same time Thomas Pynchon is the cool countercultural writer par excellence. Uh, he is very much a cult writer, whereas Umberto Eco is a square writer. He's probably the squarest writer on my shelf, and he always comes across as fairly square, even when he's talking about uh, counterculture, even when he's talking about state-sanctioned fascism, even when he's exposing the imperialist and racist tendencies ingrained within our culture, even when he's talking about sex and drugs, really. The other side of this coin, though, I think it's fair to say, is that Echo might be cerebral, he might be square, but he is also a very engaging, very warm-hearted writer. He wouldn't, his books wouldn't be bestsellers if he was writing cold and abstract fiction. All of his stories, no matter how tied they are to specific matters of scholastic reasoning, are always also connected with the very real, very relatable concerns of the characters at their heart, with the way in which these ideas and these thoughts come to shape their own ambitions and their own dreams and the world they inhabit. Because of this very perceivable interest in human matters, because of his interest in character Characters who, at the end of the day, are always a bit lost and always very afraid. He is definitely a writer I would recommend to everybody. A writer who I think everybody can uh, enjoy, can appreciate and can uh, make their own. Especially readers, especially big readers, obviously because of how much he has to say uh, on the nature of books, on how books come to shape our lives and our thoughts. He is uh, a reader's writer, if that makes sense. By readers, I mean, of course, big readers, bookworms, uh, call yourself how you see most fit. Today, to talk about Echo, I will be ranking his novels, his seven novels, um, just as a way of uh, thinking back to how, what I think about them, uh, the ones that resonated with me the most, 
Um, I'll give a few thoughts about them. I won't talk about the plots. Uh, I'm not going to spoil any of these books. And I'll give some suggestions on which ones among these I think are good books for somebody who maybe uh, is looking into getting into Echo's fiction or maybe has read one of his books, probably The Name of the Rose, and is looking for a suggestion on what to read next. Last in the list is La Misteriosa Fiamma della Regina Luana. Uh, an interesting analysis of the popular culture uh, of the uh, fascist regime, uh, the popular culture in Italy in the 1930s and the early 40s. Uh, readers of Umberto Eco's Or Fascism, uh, a brilliant essay that everybody must read because of how illuminating, how insightful it is uh, when it comes to identifying fascism within various political systems. I'll put a link in the description box. It takes an hour to read it, you will never forget it. Readers of Or Fascism will recognize quite a few uh, of uh, Eco's personal recollections from his own youth in the final years of the Italian fascist regime in La Misteriosa Fiamma uh, itself. There is lots to appreciate in here, even though, even by Eco's standards, it's more rambling than most, but I think we can all agree uh, that this novel is just an excuse for Eco to look back to the popular music, uh, the comic books, the adventure stories of his youth uh, and reminisce about them. We, we allow it because he has so many interesting things to say about them and because we read his other books with great pleasures. But I think this is very much a novel for the fans. Number six is actually The Name of the Rose, Echo's most successful novel by far. Funnily enough, I, I've read once that he himself actually considered it his worst novel. Uh, the premise of the book is uh, absolutely brilliant, uh, a murder mystery set in a medieval abbey uh, with a genius uh, anti-literam Sherlock Holmes friar investigating the murders, uh, everything recorded by a fairly hapless Holmes character, but to be honest I found it to be as exciting in parts as it was boring in others. The theological reflections and discussions relevant uh, at the time of the novel weighed, uh, I mean, at the time of the novel setting, weigh down the action quite a bit uh, and make it a fairly slow, I found it fairly difficult uh, reading. It's a cult novel and if you're at all interested in Echo, it's a bit of a must read just because of how much it's become part of our shared cultural canon, but I personally think that it did much better elsewhere. Next Next on my list is Numero Zero, Echo's uh, last novel, uh, an exciting book about the dirty world of journalism with one foot squarely placed in the world of political intrigue. Or is it? Who's to say? It was actually my first Umberto Eco novel and I really, really liked it. I think it's a very exciting book, uh, it's fast-paced, it's stimulating and it has uh, something very interesting to say about the decadence of the cultural world and the social conversation in the Italy uh, in 1990s Italy. The one criticism that is generally moved against Numero Zero I think is fairly valid and that criticism is that this feels very much like a minor work in his canon compared to its other novels. Even beyond that the fact stands that he's actually explored many of Numero Zero's themes and even used the basis of its plot more successfully in others of his books especially in Foucault's Pendulum. Uh, it's a great book I think, but it's unlikely to rock your world. L'Isola del Giorno Prima, The Island of the Day Before, is very much like The Name of the Rose to me. Uh, it has a brilliant premise, uh, a man somehow uh, lands on a uh, an abandoned ship in the middle of the sea, just off the coast of a desert island in the tropics, and he has to find his way around this ship, has to find a way to survive. It's a brilliant stimulating premise, which is bogged down somewhat just by how much echo accumulates on top of the novel, uh, just by all the scientific, philosophical, uh, literary discussions that he intertwines with this basic plot. 
Unlike The Name of the Rose, where the cerebral side of the novel is concerned with medieval theology, L'Isola, uh, the island, is concerned with the zeitgeist of the 17th century, this century of revolutions uh, in the social and scientific and cultural landscape of the European continent. Uh, and it's very successful, I find, in highlighting just how special, just how unique the 17th century was, just uh, how many new discoveries, how many revolutions were really uh, um, changing the way people looked at their place in the universe, at their place on earth, at their place within society. Even so, probably because it tries to capture this immense complexity, it only succeeds in parts, and while some of its passages are truly engaging and even hilarious, others left me a little bit cold. The next three are the books I consider Echo's masterpieces. The first of these is Baudolino. Eco plays with alternate history um, in many of his other novels. He, um, he plays with unlikely, even preposterous plots in, in the best possible sense. But Baudolino is the one place where he tries his hand at fantasy, at least in part of the novel, and to really great results, I found. Baudolino is a story of friendship and adventure. It's a story about knights doing what knights do, misusing their power, getting drunk a lot, questing after unlikely dreams. It's a story about the medieval mind and medieval imagination that does what the best uh, historical fiction manage manages to achieve, which is on the one hand to show how this uh, remote time, the, the medieval world, was different from our own, while at the same time also highlighting the similarities between the two times, the things that connect us modern people with our own concerns, with the people living centuries, who lived centuries before us. More than his other novels, I am not quite sure how well this one translates or travels. Uh, I must say that part of the reason why I found it so interesting and so engaging is that it deals, especially in its first half, very much with my native land, uh, or at least my native neck of the woods in northern Italy, uh, and I can see how it might not be to every reader's taste. It is by all means quite rambly and in some places really silly, uh, but if you're the right type of reader for this book, you're gonna have immense fun with it. It's truly engaging, truly captivating, heartbreaking breaking but also hilarious. Coming up next is The Prague Cemetery. If you read one Umberto Eco novel, I think it should be The Prague Cemetery. If you're looking for your first Eco novel or your second or third Eco novel, The Prague Cemetery is the one to read. It's a great study of the nature of hate, racism, prejudice and fear, and it digs deep and opens bare the heart of darkness of European cultural fear and prejudice. In our current world, where fear and prejudice and racism are far from vanquished, in fact, they're on the rise in many places, this is a a priceless historical and cultural uh, document and on top of that it's a it's a great page turner it combines a mysterious and engaging pseudo romantic story of uh, misplaced identities with more political intrigue than you can possibly wave a stick at. On top of that, it's an impressive literary game. All of the characters in the novel, or at least the vast majority of them, are actual historical figures and their words in the book, their speech, their conversation, is taken by Echo from real-life statements and historical reports and pamphlets and books to show even more clearly that the narrative of hate hate and fear and violence that unfolds within the Prague Cemetery is not Echo's gloomy invention, but it is historical truth. Last, but definitely not least, my favorite Echo novel, Foucault's Pendulum. Foucault's Pendulum is a sprawling novel, it is Echo's longest, and arguably it is the one where his usual narrative flows are most evident, including uh, the tendency his books have to ramble on a little before 
actually picking up with the action or at the other end their tendency to overstay their welcome just a bit rather than ending once the action reaches its climax. It also feels somewhat like a composite novel. Thinking back to it, I almost remember it as two or three different narratives intertwined together so that it's impossible to pull them apart. It's not just two novels that were fused into one, while at the same time uh, keeping their own distinctive feel uh, and ideas and properties. Because of all this, because of the complexity of its uh, narrative games, its ideas, uh, the concepts it tries to embrace, uh, Foucault's Pendulum reminds me somewhat of those great 20th century novels uh, such as Ulysses or such as Gravity's Rainbow, with one great difference. Foucault's Pendulum is immensely incredibly engaging on a page-by-page -page level. Whether it's in the fantastical intrigues of its plot, uh, in its preposterous and batshit characters, in the way it portrays in such a brilliantly snide uh, and hilarious way the hypocrisy of the cultural world, uh, or in the way it portrays young men of intellect coping with times of great violence. On all of these fronts, Foucault's pendulum is engrossing, uh, it's intriguing, stimulating, and is bound to stay with you long after you've finished reading it. It's one of those novels that I'm still reeling from years after my first read. At its heart, Foucault's Pendulum is a study of how conspiracy theories and proto-scientific thought emerge of what looks like scientific debate, but is actually a perversion of critical thinking. For this reason, just as uh, the Prague Cemetery, Foucault's Pendulum is an impossibly valuable document in today's world, where more than ever the social and political and scientific debate is polluted by people twisting the rules of intellectual conversation and debate to advance their own narrow and hypocritical uh, and biased agendas. Balbo's theory of the distinction of foolish people in the four categories, um, Cretans, idiots, stupid people and mad people, has stayed with me ever since I first read it, as has the novel's incredibly beautiful final page. Foucault's Pendulum is my favorite Echoes novel, as I said, but uh, Prague Cemetery and Baudolino are also masterpieces, if you ask me. And to be honest, I've enjoyed the other four very, very much too. And I don't really think you can go wrong whichever novel you choose uh, to read as, you, as your first Echo. Although, go with Prague Cemetery uh, if you're looking for a suggestion. That's it for my conversation. Uh, I really want to hear from you now. Uh, what do you think about Umberto Eco? Are you a fan too? Do you agree with some of the criticisms generally moves against him? Uh, do you think he has some significant and, and common flow? I really look forward to talking about all this in the comment section as always. Thank you so much for watching this video guys, um, thank you to my patrons for sponsoring, supporting the YouTube channel and thank you to Skillshare, uh, the sponsor of today's video. Skillshare is an awesome online community of creators and creatives offering a broad array of video classes on so many topics from illustration to, to life skills, uh, blogging, creative writing, gardening and so much more. All of these classes are taught in a very insightful but also very friendly and very appropriate approachable style and they are split into shorter videos so that you can arrange them around your own schedule and your own priorities. A class that I took recently and that I really enjoyed was called Start Drawing, Three Fun Freeing Exercises to Spark Your Creativity by Carly Kuhn. I was interested in taking this class, as with so many other Skillshare classes, to gain some inspiration on how to make the most of my downtime, find new ways to relax and be creative in a totally laid-back environment such as Skillshare. I really enjoyed the class and Carly's take on some creative exercises to uh, try to look anew at the way you draw. I love to sketch personally and I draw a lot, but I'm often unhappy with my results. But Carly's friendly and insightful take taught me to look at my sketches under a different light. After taking this class, I'll definitely be applying her tips to my own sketching, and I'm hoping that they'll inspire me to try whole new approaches when it comes to drawing. I highly recommend you check Skillshare out. There is a link 
at the top of the description box for this video and the first thousand people to click on that link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Thank you so much again for watching and bye everybody. <music>